Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Really happy today to be joined by Jenny Magira, who is the Global Head of Education Impact at Google. Google has a really interesting set of trend reports that are coming out. The first one has just dropped. We're going to be digging into that a bit. But before we do any of that, I'd like to welcome Jenny to the show. Jenny, welcome to Trending in Education. Thanks, Michael. I'm so excited to be here today. It's fantastic to have you. Google has provided us with a lovely present. For those of us who care about the future of education, there's a new trend report out. We're going to pick up with you on that in a bit. But before we do that, we always like to start with your origin story so that folks can get to know you a little bit. Can you catch us up on how you got to this point in your professional life? Yeah, so I'll try and be as concise as possible. So right now I am talking to you from Chicago, Illinois, the Windy City. I right now I'm serving as the global head of education impact at Google on the Google for Education team. But I started my career back in New York City. I have been an educator for my entire career. So I started off in New York City Department of Ed, and then I came from there to Chicago Public Schools. Overall, spent about a decade teaching in the classroom, mostly middle grades, math and science, and then kind of took your traditional educator path. So I went to become a building leader, instructional coach, a district administrator, so a cabinet level district admin um, right outside of Chicago by the airport here, I'm a chief uh, technology officer and then a CIO, sure. and then did some work under the Obama administration, helping to rewrite the National Ed Tech Plan back in 2016, 2017, sure. did some teaching in higher ed, master's students, wrote a book, did a TED Talk, sure. so you know, started to kind of grow my voice, grow my platform, and then all of that kind of grew into my work until I kind of snowballed into this role. And so now I'm trying to support educators around the world with our team to make sure that they're getting the most impact out of our solutions, that when they bring technology into their classroom, they're seeing positive change in the teaching and learning environment, helping educators understand how to do that, connect with each other, get validation and recognition, but then help education leaders enable their education systems as well. And be transformative leaders in their spaces as a part of that too. Yeah, congratulations on that. And you're not even done. You're just getting started, but that's quite a track record there. Also, I did like some of the crossover moves to technology front. Not every educator goes from being award-winning teacher to someone who is then responsible for educational technology, which is amazing. Also, you mentioned to me earlier, you're also the parent of a student as well, which is another thing that we both share in common, parents of preschoolers, which is another lens through which we can attack the world of education, or maybe not attack, maybe just engage with the world of, of education. And then through that lens and with that background and that really important role, which is global head of education impacts, what do you think about a company like Google? whose search and YouTube properties are truly global, certainly impactful. They're even written up in the report. There are three trends in this report. Again, I was giving you a Google credit. The rule of three, humans can't remember long lists. We're doing this in, in sets of three, which I like. Can you walk us through the three trends that are in the report? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Michael. As you name the rule of three, both for, you know, the human mind and also, you know, fairy tale three. Yeah. So this is the first of three chapters, and we have three trends in each chapter. So mm -hmm. in this chapter one, it's all about preparing for the new future. It's about the learner themselves, like how are we going to prepare for what's coming ahead? Mm -hmm. And the three trends in this chapter are first about kind of that mindset of being a global problem solver and how you want to approach as a citizen of the world and how much we want as an education institution and industry to think about the learners and how they need to situate themselves in the space. Mm -hmm. The second is about the skill sets required for work. So how are the learners going to be prepared for the work future that they're going into? And a lot of the research showing that is kind of ambiguous. It's a little bit foggy. So how do we prepare them for the unknown future? and set them up for success. Mm -hmm. And then third and finally, that lifelong learning mindset. You know, Michael, you and I were talking before we started recording about we're still lifelong learners and we're always growing. You mentioned like my career, you know, is just beginning in some yeah. ways. How am I constantly growing and learning and upskilling both as Jenny the Googler, but as Jenny the mom, as Jenny the 
human being is Jenny the neighbor, the daughter. So constantly learning and never feeling like when I graduate from my K-12 or K-20 experience, like done, I've learned everything, I've got all the way to pull as I'm out, but then I'm always improving on myself. Yeah, absolutely. The 60 year curriculum is a concept that I've talked about a few times on the show. Step Lee captured my imagination and I was really happy to see that reinforced through this report because it is something I'm certainly feeling now where as a Gen X person, a Gen Xer, it's been a little bit of while since I was in college. And to think that I had all the information I needed then to really navigate the world that we're living in today is certainly not the case. And that is true really regardless of where you are in your lifetime. And also the point is laid out in detail here that folks are going to be living longer. You know, 100 years is not beyond the question for kids who are really just starting their educational journeys today and to think about how do we design for that. And it is also a type of strategic horizon that organizations like Google can and should be adopting. So it is a, a nice opportunity to, to see some thought leadership there. The other thing I mentioned, and maybe we could dig in a little more into the first trend around the rising demand for global problem solvers. Your research, it looked like something like 24 countries, I and mean, it was it was truly global in its nature. Can you describe how the research was structured and how you were tapping into a genuinely global audience? Yeah, there are a number of ways. You got the number right. And you know, as a math teacher, I love how many numbers we're already naming in this. So there were 94 experts over 24 countries. And we wanted to really make sure that we were um, looking at the, again, that global mindset, but also knowing that there's no uniform answer to what the future is. Like there is no real crystal ball. The best we could do is try and find trends. Yeah, yeah. So you now the education space is incredibly complex. Um, something else I really appreciate that we named right up at the front of the research report is there's a hierarchy of needs in education, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Something that's very real to me as someone who worked in New York City, Chicago, and then um, more affluent suburbs, and then at a national level, is some systems have that luxury of building for the future. And some schools that I served in or worked with, it was like all about what's the newest, what's the best, what's the biggest. And others, it was how do we get reading and writing? I had a fourth grader who didn't know the letters of their alphabet that I was teaching. And so I was all about like, how do I help this child get to grade level proficiency? In, in literacy and in math. Yeah. So like I wasn't thinking about the future, I was thinking about the now and like right. very concrete skills, attendance, making sure they had their breakfast. Yeah. So what the future of education for different institutions, different communities, different settings is very complex and nuanced. And so we wanted to make sure we weren't being myopic in this research. So not only did we look across 94 experts, 24 countries, we also did a keyword search on the future of education. We use a media intelligence platform called NetBase Quid, looked at that keyword search about it for over a five-year period from 2016 to 2021, just looking at what people were talking about across mm -hmm. the web. And it, it surfaced important events and topics that fed into that global analysis. Mm -hmm. There was also peer-reviewed academic publications. So what are other people writing about? Desk research, media narrative analysis. So really just trying to put our proverbial ear to the landscape and listen to what everyone is saying mm -hmm. and then synthesize all of that into the trends that we're hearing to help us inform what might be most likely in the years to come in education. Yeah, yeah. And it definitely comes through. And that's where I did find the global perspective to be important. One trend area that we talk a lot about is the future of work, which I know is something that really informs a lot of the thinking in this report. The idea that from an early age, if you're thinking about the potential for global engagement in your child's career, that's a huge improvement really in a lot of ways if you are trying to get out ahead of things. And then before we go on to the second trend, I just wanted to maybe hear a little more from you about problem solving as the word choice, I know Google is very selective in its language, and I imagine problem solving, there was some thinking that went into talking about problem solving. What made you land on that turn of phrase? I think it's all about like the authenticity of the learning experience and approaching, you know, this trend and understanding what we heard from all of those experts, the research, et cetera, was about centering around, you know, solutioning for the future. 
So, you know, as an educator and an educator of other adults, you know, the, the phrase problem solving can be remixed in other words, like, you know, challenge based learning, opportunity based learning, if you want to positively frame it. Yeah. But essentially, they're all looking at solutioning, at looking at authentic problems that are contextual, either in your local environment or global in nature, yeah. and then trying to use all of the information and synthesizing all of the learning that you have to build better future, better opportunities, better solution sets. And all of the experts that we were hearing from really were centering on that trend of where we're at right now as a global community is the issues that we're seeing are asking learners to position themselves as more active within their communities. And so we're wanting them to see them more engaged in civic life. We're wanting to see them take a look at being more deeply empathetic, not only in their own community, but the community at large. Mm. That gets into the social emotional competencies that this yeah. chapter talks about. So for me as a Chicagoan, as you know, an Asian a uh, woman, mother who lives in Chicago, who's an educator, who doesn't eat enough vegetables, but loves to read, like all the intersectionality of who I am. Mm -hmm. How do I build empathy with you, Michael, yeah. as a father, yeah. someone from Brooklyn, you know, your yeah. content? How do I understand the problems that make us more similar, but also create the differences between us? What do I do to show up in my space to be a solution oriented citizen of my community and of the world? And so, what we are really seeing is as an education industry, how are we raising our learners to grow up into a space where they are thinking in a way that they can solve problems both locally and globally and create empathy with folks both next door and across the ocean. Yeah, I love the connection to empathy where not just an understanding and being able to identify your own problems and your own solutions, but taking that next order step to understand beyond just my problems, what might other people have as far as problems go? And it, it actually, it's so hard to teach. So when I was teaching grade five, my science students, I did challenge-based learning as an educator. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was trying to do was a CBL unit around the water shortage crisis out West. Now we're in Chicago, because I mentioned a million times, I'm very proud to be in Chicago. And we have what we like to call a Grace Lake. It's wonderful. It's stupendous. It's great. Right. And so we have this like really large source of fresh water. I'm very proud of our tap water. Like our water source is amazing. So when we hear about water shortages out West, it's very hard for my, you know, nine and 10 year olds in my classroom to fathom. Mm. You, what do you mean you can only take short showers and only water your lawn on certain days? What does that even mean? Mm. It's raining all the time here. So, you know, I was trying to do the CBL unit with my intermediate students and help them build that empathy with folks in Denver, in mm. San Diego, and understand what does it mean to have a drought? Yeah. And it, that, I thought it would be simple enough to read an article, to do a quick video call, but it was so much more nuanced to build that deep uh, connection with it. it. We did pen pals. We talked about daily routines. Yeah. We had students do a virtual shadow day where it was like, what are the things in your day that change when you have a limit to the amount of water that you can access? Then we realized that we needed to talk to places in other parts of the world where water access was even more extreme. We talked to folks out in parts of the world where it's not just a lack of water, but clean water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was before there was the water issues that were more close to home here in the Midwest. Right. This is three years ago that I did this unit, but I think building empathy can't be something that I, you know, I think that was the first time I really thought about it in my career. Like I need to build empathy to do this water yeah. shortage with my science students. But moving forward from that, I realized that I had to start building empathy as a muscle and a skill for all of my students throughout the year, because it's something that we need to be able to do as human beings and not just to meet this one specific science standard. Yeah, absolutely. And to your previous point about lifelong learning, it's something that we all need to continue to remind ourselves. Those empathy muscles need to continue to get work as we move on in life, where frequently a lot of the the polarization and the other problems we're seeing with adults nowadays are in many ways tied to similar challenges around empathy and perspective taking, social emotional skills. That is part of the change in skill sets required for work that comes up as your second trend. My initial thought was 
well, what does this mean around, you know, engineering and technology You were a math teacher? So it does certainly connect to the quote unquote harder skills, but at the same time, there's a lot of attention in the report to collaborative exercises and the ability to work with others. Can you outline for us a little bit what went into the second trend? This trend is validating for me because it was something I've been talking about too as an educator for a long time. And it was great to see that more research research has come out to, you know, double click and unpack on that concept that the jobs that our kindergartners will be in when they're adults, your child, my kids don't exist yet. Right. Yep. And I'm in a job that didn't exist when I was a young person either. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and the fact that as new jobs are created, current jobs that folks are in today are going to cycle out. So there, there is this space where things are going to turn over and refresh. Yeah, I know you like me naming numbers, so I'm going to try to do a little more here. According to the World Economic Forum, by 2025, technological change may see 97 million new jobs created, while 85 million existing roles may disappear. Obviously, the margins of error and it's forecasting, et cetera, but that's plus 12 million. So that's surprising when people think about automation. Immediately, there's a fear that humans will become less needed. This is actually arguing that there will be more new jobs created than those that will be replaced. But it's also a challenge where that's 97 million new jobs and 85 million jobs that went away. There's a lot of churn in the system and the way we approach education to address all of that is something that certainly is going to require a lot of thought. So I, I just wanted to jump in on that because I found those numbers to be somewhat optimistic, but also there's a real challenge behind those numbers as well. I love that you named that. I think it's really hopeful. I think this chapter is about excitement and hope of like how we set our students up and our learners up for the future and to be successful. Mm -hmm. You're right. I think that there is that wonder of like, oh, am I going to get automated out? You know, is this going to be like, it's not a sci-fi movie where the robots take over the world. Yeah. No, I don't think this chapter is about Skynet. You know, this isn't the Terminator. This is really about what new thing can we teach our children? And I think it's about double clicking on our humanity. And that wasn't a pun. I really mean that. And I think about what we're approaching. There's Another um, quote in here in the research and the report about, we have to better understand how humans and machines can work together in productive ways. But to do that, we need to see what humans can do that, that robots, that AI can't do. And that's those soft skills, those problem solving skills that you named, the analytical thinking and innovation, the active learning, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis. Like what is valuable for us in the future is going to be what sets ourselves apart. So the automated pieces that we can get machines to do quicker, faster, better than we can will complement the human pieces that we will always be doing better. There's two things that I want to name here. One is a quick example. Going back to my classroom, another um, research project my students did, again, being in the Midwest, we're very close to Motor City and like the great car production spaces and cities in, in the Midwest. And so one of my students had just moved from Detroit and was talking about um, his dad had this really cool new job at Ford and he used to be an assembly line worker, but then he went back to school. So that's kind of a foreshadow preview of lifelong learning. And now he had this really cool computer science based job where he was programming the robot that now did his job, but mm -hmm. he was making more money and he was so happy. And now he wanted to be a computer scientist. They had moved to Chicago because his dad could like move back home to Chicago to be by his family because yeah. he could work anywhere because he wasn't sitting on the assembly line. That inspired us to do this job where my students were trying to research like this article that we read about machines taking the place of humans and there are less jobs in the motor industry because of machines. Mm -hmm. But what my students were able to figure out were there are actually more jobs because like this young man's father, they needed computer scientists to program the bots, to build the pieces for the robots, to fix them, to problem solve them, to come up with new concepts, to build the programs, to build better cars, the microchips, like so many more jobs went into that. And those jobs had a lot more of these types of skills that you're talking about. So my students did a preview to this research about a decade ago. So go fourth graders. But then the other thing that this reminds me of is what I teach teachers about how to bring ed tech into the classroom. And that's a bit about what I wrote in my book as well, mm -hmm. is that technology is not meant to supplant the teacher. That's not the best use of tech. 
I'm a huge sci-fi nerd. I love Star Trek to my bones. And one of the Star Trek movies, they show the Vulcan Academy of Science. And you see a young Spock and all of the other Vulcan students standing in these recessed holes in a giant amphitheater room at the Vulcan Academy of Science. And they're by themselves. They're in these 360 screen siloed mm. holes in the ground. Mm. And all the instructors are walking around above them, just looking down into these holes where students are interacting with a 360 degree screen all mm. alone learning all day in like pitch darkness. And that sounds terrible to me. Right. Tech in schools should be better connecting students to their humanity. It should be allowing them to dive more deeply into those skill sets that humans could do so much better than tech. And it should be connecting learners with each other. Mm -hmm. Like that's why I love working with our team on Google Meet and Google Classroom because it's about connecting students together with instructors and double clicking on all of those growing skill sets that make them better at being human beings. If we use technology appropriately in the classroom, we're going to grow those soft skills, those powerful human only skill sets that will get them ready to be more successful in the future to work alongside technology, creating more opportunity and allowing for them to solve all those global problems we talked about in chapter one. Yeah, absolutely. And it does seem like there are two sides to the coin where one is the durable soft skills, power skills, a lot of different ways to talk about it. The things that are about collaborating, being creative, communicating effectively, all the C word there. But then on the other side, there are more yeah. technical competencies, computer science in particular, something you talked about. It's something that does show up in the second trend that you're identifying here, where there is a real challenge in terms of building in new competencies around engineering, computer science, technology that aren't really in our K-12 system nowadays. So as someone who has about as much experience and perspective as one could have in this space, I'd love to hear a little more about how you see us connecting those two sets of competencies, the social, emotional, work with others, power skills, durable skills on the one hand, but then these harder technical competencies how do we find time for that in K-12? K-12 struggling. Any yeah. perspective on how we can start to address some of this? I know. I, I mean, you're speaking to my soul here. Like the scarcity of instructional minutes in mm -hmm. education is a, is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And I, I constantly felt that way. If I looked at the instructional minutes and I had in my day, first of all, I'd laugh. because I'd be like, I actually don't have that many minutes. So I have to take my students to the bathroom. Like there's transition time. Yeah. There's like... Someone spilled their milk in the lunchroom, so we're 20 minutes late getting back upstairs. There's a whole thing, right? Yeah. Um, so when you get down to the brass tacks of like, okay, I have to teach literacy. I have to teach my math. I have to teach this. Like, when am I going to teach computer science and empathy and all of these other things? Yeah. That's where I think what I named about bringing technologies into the classroom can be really powerful because it creates efficiency. So for me, when I was first started teaching and I didn't have like one-to-one -one devices in my classroom, everything was manual. Everything was by hand. All my transitions took a ton of time. And there was one me. I didn't have a, a teaching assistant in my grade six classroom, grade three classroom. It was just me and sometimes 40 students. Yeah. And then when I brought one-to-one -one devices, when I had those Chromebooks in my class, I was able to, first of all, clone myself. So I would create little videos on YouTube and I could have my students like have five or six different versions of that mathematics mini lesson taught by Ms. McGarrow all at the exact same time. So I was running six small groups in real time simultaneously. Yeah. Secondly, real time assessment feedback. So I was okay. using Google Forms. My students were submitting it. They were getting immediate emails back using kind of a mail merge thing that I had figured out where it would be like, great job, Michael. You got it. Like lattice multiplication. You're ready to move on to partial products. They didn't have to wait for me. I didn't have to sit and grade in real time where before I would sit there with their exit tickets at the kidney table, grading them one at a time, taking yeah. 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So all those, like I did a mood check in every day where they came in. And they filled out a Google form, set a goal for the day, said how they're feeling. If anyone had any certain needs that were flags for me, something they wanted to positively celebrate or maybe a safety concern, an emotional challenge, it would pop up on my desktop and say like, hey, you need to meet with these kids during your prep. Mm -hmm. I saved 
hours of time each week, being able to automate all these processes that I was doing manually. And that opened up so much more time in my instructional day to dig into, you know, having entire units around building empathy, around exploring computer science and engineering skills. I found I was just a much more efficient practitioner and my students were able to get the access to the learning topics and the learning supports that they needed in much quicker ways because of the way that I used technology. And again, it wasn't removing me from a classroom. It was allowing me to be a better version of myself as an instructor. Yeah, absolutely. And you think about both the time-saving efficiency angle and then also the communication revolution that has happened where if you want to learn Portuguese or Mandarin or Arabic, you could now partner with another school. And, and, you know, there are new capabilities that certainly get my wheels turning that are fascinating, all powered by ideally that orientation towards problem solving and understanding our humanity better. That leads us into the Third trend, which in our rule of three, those of you who are waiting, completionists out there, we are about to talk about our third trend, which is, I really like something that I talk a lot about with many folks on this show is the importance of mindsets, not just skill sets, and that there are more foundational frames of reference, ways of being, ways of working, ways of engaging with the world that ultimately are going to build that resilience and that learner identity, that learning motor that ideally will continue to be powered by your curiosity throughout your life. I was very happy to see that included because it did almost feel like a way to recognize the limited visibility we have. You know, even if we are talking about new skills emerging, the skills that emerge today, 20 years from now, many of them will likely be replaced. And how do you design for a longer horizon. One way in which you do that is you don't just think about the skill set, you also think about mindsets. Can you catch us up a, a bit more on the third trend in our triumvirate? Yeah. So, you know, this is that lifelong learning concept we've been tickling at throughout the show today and really starting to dig into, you know, you're never done. Let's say like you, you go to college, graduate school, like you might think like, all right, I got all my degrees. I have all my diplomas on my wall. I am educated, finished, close mm -hmm. that book. Well, mm -hmm. no, you're never finished. And I, I don't think this is technically, you know, I think we're putting a name on it and identifying a mindset as you named. I think the other thing that's really different is like the access to be able to learn. So I think back to my mother and my mother and my father actually were both career changers. But when they changed jobs, unlike today, they had to go physically. They had to drive to a community center, take classes, pass the test to be able to get a new certificate. Now, to be able, if you want to be a career changer, you could do something like we have Bro with Google where you can get career certificates. I can be sitting in pajama pants with a glass of hot cocoa after work and sit and do all of my courses online on the weekends on my own time. I don't have to go anywhere. The other thing that's nice too, is I can take a taste of it with both of my parents. When my father decided to get his real estate license, my mom decided to check out the wild world of, of stock brokering. They had to commit, they had to pay a fee up front and go to this. I think it was like 12 weeks, like multi months long commitment. Whereas now I can like, let me just watch a quick YouTube video. Let me Google it. Let me, you know, check out a piece of this and to see if it if it feels right. So there's the big upscaling of career changing, but then there's the small piece where I, like many people during the pandemic, decided that I was an at-home baker and I wanted to try my own sourdough starter, which, mm -hmm. spoiler alert, was a disaster. I made zero sourdough, but mm -hmm. I wanted to try. And so I read blogs, I watched YouTube videos, I tried creating and I had multiple attempts at creating a sourdough life form on my kitchen counter. I think it cost me like maybe a grand total of 10 or $15 in flour and yeast and et cetera. Yeah. I didn't have to go to a baking school. I never left my house, you know, grocery delivered everything. And so I had that entire exploration of curiosity attempts, failure, et cetera, the entire arc of learning without ever leaving my house, the spending very little money. So this chapter is all about how technologies are allowing people to have this more open stance at learning. And there's a much lower barrier to continuing to improve yourself and take risks, which yeah. I'm super excited about. 
Yeah, absolutely. And then I guess the challenge with this area is really breaking through to folks who may not think this way, right? This is the growth mindset problem where if people don't think of themselves as, I don't really, I'm done learning. I don't really, I don't really have time to go online. I don't really understand technology. There's a lot of self-limiting beliefs that prevent us from reaching our full potential as lifelong learners. How are you thinking about that? To your point, there's a couple of things as you named. I think one of it is being stuck in your schema or your situational memory of this is what learning looks like. I have to be, I have to pay money, I have to be in a classroom, I have to sit down, I have to like have a dedicated amount of time to grow versus it can be like more interstitial. Like here's a moment, here's another moment and sure. it could cost zero dollars or like a nominal fee. So that's one mindset we need to break through and the awareness of like a mindset and awareness of resources. The other is that like commitment piece in general, like learning isn't about I'm getting a degree, but it can happen in these small pieces in these small moments. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a green tea drinker. I love it. And I noticed like it's always kind of bitter and funky. And so finally I decided to just like Google, like, how do you make green tea? And I found out like my water has been too hot my entire life. Wow. And I'm being the tea bag in for too long. I was treating it like black tea mm. where it was like boiling water, just leave it in, drink it until I have a soggy bag at the bottom. No, yeah. green tea, moderately hot water. After two to three minutes, take it out, throw out the tea bag. That's a good cup of green tea. You know, that's such a small thing, but it was life changing for me to learn that. So oh. I think that people are lifelong learners. People are Googling these things all the time. But giving yourself credit for that continuous improvement and then building on that is is huge. Yeah, I like the idea and you've been doing it here, like actually naming and noting and being grateful for those opportunities and also being grateful for the struggle, which maybe is even a harder lesson to teach. The whole idea that, you know, the resilience, the perseverance to continue to try, even when things are hard, is something that we all need to continue to remind ourselves of, continue to learn really throughout our lives. Fascinating stuff. Really recommend folks will include links to the report on our show page. It's been wonderful having you here with us, Jenny. As we're getting close to conclusion, I always love to ask my guests what out there in the world, besides what we've been talking about, is capturing your imagination. Anything out there you want to call attention to? Anything you think our listeners might benefit from hearing about? So, you know, before we got on this call, Michael, you and I were talking about like our semi-new role of being parents, right? We both have preschoolers at home. So we're fairly green and new into this whole, like, I made a human world. And how do I raise this tiny roommate that lives in my house all the time? You know, so as I mentioned to you in the pre-show, I've been an educator my whole adult life, but being a parent, I'm just now figuring out where that intersection of educator plus parent is Truly. so showing up to I, I went to my first parent teacher conference the other day and it was like a really eerie thing to be on the other side of the table so I was googling like all of these resources for parents about how to be like supportive but not annoying <laughs> as a as a partner to a teacher because I remember as a teacher like having parents who showed up and I was like so grateful for their partnership and others less so but then I found like there are all of these resources out there, digital resources for parents about connecting with other parents, Facebook groups, Google groups, like ways for us to be united, like raising the next generation. And then, you know, and I say this with a little bit of, uh, of embarrassment, like clicking into like the tools at Google that we have, like not just YouTube videos, but what we have within classroom for parents to dig into. I found parents making Google classrooms and working with each other and doing book clubs. So kind of that global learning mindset, but as a parent, like how am I connecting with parents around the world to see what it's like to be a parent? And I also have been digging into my child is multiracial. Good. So I, and I'm not, I'm all Korean. So like, what does that mean for my children? Mm -hmm. So connecting with parents around the world around raising multiracial children has been something that's really alerted my global mindset. Mm -hmm. um, really thinking about that skill set that I have, like, what do I need to be a parent to a child of the future? Mm -hmm. And she's learning at a rate that's faster than I am. And she's coming home knowing things I don't know. And it's scary. So like, yeah. what do I need to do? What skills do I need to like be the best parent to her mm -hmm. as she grows older? 
And then finally, that lifelong learning mindset, like I'm Googling all the time, like, how do I raise a child? What do I do? I have no idea. She's not sleeping. Now she is sleeping. She's sleeping too long. So what do I need to do to click into that? And how do I use the resources at my fingertips to do that? And, you know, Google has a lot of things out there that are supporting, but all the technologies and all the technology companies that are not just supporting the young learners out there, but the guardians, the parents, the adults that surround and love and support them has been really eye-opening for me. And I'm so grateful for. That's fantastic. Yeah, it does remind me of one of the perhaps silver linings of the last few years with the pandemic is the activation of parents and caretakers and guardians. And if handled well with the right level of empathy and the, the social graces we were talking about earlier, parents and teachers can really start to unlock new potentials in their relationships, which ultimately will advance the rising generations. It's all wonderful stuff. Jenny Magira is the global head of education impact at Google. Wonderful conversation. Since there are three of these coming out, I'm hoping we'll get Jenny on subsequent episodes of Trending in Education. As we conclude here, Jenny, I always like to give guests a chance to summarize and provide some takeaways for folks who might be listening. Can you provide us with some closing thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're really excited to bring this report, The Future of Education, to the world. Thank you so much. We couldn't have done this without all of the educational experts out there who took time to speak with us and share their expertise. And, you know, as as I named, there is no one singular future of education. This isn't us like pointing a pin on the future roadmap of the world. These are about trends that are informing how we might look at that to better understand the innovation of tomorrow's educational outlook and how we can make sure we're supporting that as best as we can as a partner to educators and learners around the world. So we hope that you enjoy part one. Stay tuned as part two and part three drops soon. I was joking with Michael. I feel like we're like an internet uh, TV streamer. We're like part one of the season drop today. Binge read it and then wait for the next one. But we can't wait to connect with you out in the world and, and hear your thoughts and reactions and grow into the future alongside everyone here. Fantastic stuff from Jenny Magera, the global head of education impact at Google. Really interesting, accessible, relevant report. We'll include links to it on the show page. Thanks again for joining, Jenny. Thank you. And our listeners, hopefully you enjoyed what you heard. If you did, please write us a review, share the good word. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.